So the position on the board is a uh, position from page one, diagram one of Endgame Strategy by Mikhail Shabareshke and uh, <laughs> the pink book there. So in this position, uh, white is Capablanca. And if you look at the position, you can see that white is a pawn ahead. You've got three versus three, right? Two pawns versus one pawn. And this is a really interesting position, right? And uh, what I don't get from this book, and what I'm going to throw out there is, did Capablanca look at the end game differently to other players? Right, because this is what he writes about this position, right? So you can pause the video if you want to, but I'm just going to go right into it. So he says about this position, White's plan, this is Capablanca, White's plan is to prevent the advance of the C pawn, after which the B pawn could become weak, and to control the entire board up to the fifth rank. This is achieved by moving the king to E3. Let's put that on the board to make it a bit easier. E3, not D3. Moving the king to e3 and placing the rook at c3, the knight at d4, and the pawns at b4 and f4. After he has attained such a position, white will be able to advance his queenside pawns. So, as uh, the author notes, uh, yeah, I'm just going to quote from him directly. As we see, variations did not interest Capablanca, and he was not even interested in the time and speed in which the plan position would be attained. The main thing was that the required type of position had been selected, and the subsequent play followed according to plan. So, obviously, all old strong players, all grandmasters in the end game, do plans or mini plans, but. Capablanca's here, his object was to control the fifth rank. I've never thought myself in terms of, well, in this position, I want to control the fifth rank by bringing my pieces to such a square, right? So it's just a totally bizarre way of, of sort of thinking, really. So with all the pieces on this, uh, on the fourth rank and where he's got them, he sort of controls most of most of the board, basically. Controls most of the fifth rank and the fourth rank. And he's obviously got more space, and he's got more plans, he's got more pawns, so he's got more potential in the position. But he's not thinking in terms of variations, he's not thinking uh, of in terms of moves, where should I move? He's thinking in sort of a schematic sort of plan setup where he's going to control certain ranks and files. So what I'm going to do in this video, I'm going to move forward to that position, and then it's really interesting to see how Capablanca wins this position. And this is like... You know, thousands of other positions he's won. There's a slight advantage in the end game. Well, there's a pawn up here in this in this end game, so you might say it's more than a slight advantage. But Capablanca has won countless hundreds of games like this with equal amount of pawns based on superior end game play. There's no better player in the 1920s, the 1930s perhaps, than Capablanca in the end game. Obviously, today we've got top players that are really good at the end game. Magnus Carlsen's probably the best end game player of all time. But obviously, Capablanca is the one. So let's look at how he, break, how he brings about that position and then what he does with it. So I think it's really interesting. So I like to play, first of all, knight d4. And I don't think this is a really serious attempt to try and take the bishop at all. Right, I think the knight is superior in the end game. Uh, because it controls more squares when he gets it into the centre of the board. And so let's have a look. So knight d4, rook b7, uh, obviously targeting the pawn. Well, this is absolutely fine because we know that Capablanca wants a pawn on b4 anyway. So he wants to sort of start controlling these squares. Already, we're controlling four of the squares of the fifth rank. Already, it, after just two moves. All right. So let's have a look. I play continues. Bishop, back to d7. F4. So he gets his pawn where he wants it on F4, now controlling these two further squares. King E7. And then starts to bring the king in as planned. Uh, rook into C3, where he wanted the rook. Knight D7. And he says, the setup planned by White is complete. He's now faced with a, a new problem of advancing the queenside pawns. How does Capablanca go about pushing the queen side's pawns? That's his next bit. But he didn't concern himself at that, at this position. Now, he wasn't thinking, how do I advance? He's just thinking, I'll, I'll get the basic setup that I want, and then I'll worry about that. I'll do sort of mini plans along the way. So let's, let's get back to that position. So let's, let's have a look how he does this, how he carries this out. Rook d3, 
naturally. Obviously, we were threatening just to win the rook. King e7. So uh, the author says talks about this as a repetition, and I'm not going to really read all that's not really that relevant. It just talks about how the attacking player can repeat positions because uh, it's quite a clever trick, really, but you've got a psychological edge, you're winning, black's only hoping for you know some sort of chance to draw really in most lines or looking for white to blunder. Nice little move. Let's move in into the next bit then. So 92. So how to advance these pawns is what we're looking at. So redeployment of the knight. Reacting to black, clamping down the pawns by sticking the rook on a4, back by the bishop, so it can't be kicked by the king. So he's going to redirect his knight. g6, check. King into d4. Rook moving again. Check. King d6. Knight c3. And f5. Let's look at knight c3 now, obviously. Nearly prepares this move. He can't quite do it at the moment. But he's bringing the knight to the square where he's able to advance a4 at some point. f5. Uh, so the pawns begin their advance with b5 hitting the uh, hitting the uh, the rook, obviously, and also blocking out the bishop. So this has obviously had to be done before we could play a4. We had to play b5, rook moves, and then we can start pushing. Right. So small increments, rook moves away, and let's continue. It's really interesting to see how white sort of just cruises from this position. Really slowly, methodically, responding to black's threats, not rushing into something, uh, you know, just, just totally controlling the whole board. That's what Capablanca does, this position. So it brings the king over for support. Bishop e6 check. I've lost where I am now. I always lose where I am. There we go. Right, so the king is coming over to help support the push of these pawns. And this is obviously still ideally placed. So he just rearranges his pieces to carry out uh, the uh, the movement of the queenside pawns. So we take on Poisson. So that bishop is retreated back. So we've got an outside pass pawn and no no black pawn on the C file anymore. And this is gonna be what's gonna be happening at some point. So we could do this and look to do this and push. But what's really interesting in this position and in this game is that white creates another sort of threat in the position and you know puffs out black's attack and potential attack. Let's have a look. And it's 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 not it's not long in coming. D three maneuvering. And we can see now how we've got the rook on the sixth rank, right, and then soon to be the seventh rank, squeezing black even further. Pieces are back to the first rank or the eighth rank if we're looking at it that way. And these pawns are also now a target. And this knight sits in front of the king, you know, blocking any potential checks and still holding on to the pawn. So white well, just totally dominates, right, just making small improvements. You know, this is what I do when I, I used to love playing over Capablanca games, right? Looking at how he just controls the game in the end game and how everything's just perfect and ordered and calm. And then I'd go and play an end game and my own games and it's chaos, right? So, but it's still useful looking at the top games uh, from time to time. Even if you can't replicate it, you can still pick some things up. Uh, yeah, so again, going after these pawns. And we're, we're another pawn up. Right, and then it's just all over. And black resigns at this point. So just total masterful control. So my, my original question is, did black Capablanca you know, look at the board differently to most other players at the time? I don't know the answer to that. I suspect not. I suspect it's just better than everybody else at the time, right? So going back to the original position, let's just quickly flick through that again. So first thing he did in this position, he had a mind of the setup he wanted to achieve, and then he carried that out. There's something around, around about this position. 
where he controls more space, right? And he just controls his fifth rank. And you can play this at some point if he wants to control that square, probably not necessary. And once he's achieved that, he then thinks, how do I about go, go about, you know, pushing the queen's eye pawns? How do I react to black? Uh, by maneuvering the knight, essentially, into the ideal position. Then starts advancing. You know, exchange of pawns, and the story comes about this A pawn. And something I missed, actually, was the counterplay. Knight D4. Let's get to this point. Yeah, here. Here's something that I meant to comment on. So, even with a superior endgame in this position, he's still keeping an eye on this pawn, right? And it's not going anywhere yet because of this pawn anyway, but... He's still bringing the knight back, just cutting out anything, any potential tactics. This pawn's not moving anywhere, right? He can't move anywhere because of this pawn, but, you know, maybe black could target this pawn. But with the knight on this square, potentially, it just cuts out any sort of counterplay, right? It's just really, really methodically. Black must just feel absolutely hopeless at this position. And we have a few more moves, and black calls it a day. All right, so what I'm going to do is maybe do a few more of these videos going through this great book, which is a great book uh, for intermediate players. Now, you know, 1600, 1700 is probably the recommended starting uh, rating to be looking at this book, but you could do that, uh, you know, lower rating than that as well. You can pick up strategy and a higher rating. It's a really good book. It's a classic. It's one I've only really scratched the surface off myself. So I'm going to look forward to going through this book from time to time. So take care. Goodbye.